You know, I've noticed something before I get started here. I've noticed something, and maybe you've noticed it too, but have you noticed that that people in the world only seem to give God credit for bad things that happen in the world? Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever seen the the reporter on TV and he's holding the microphone and he says, that's right, Bill, I'm standing waist deep in water because this town is experiencing a flood of biblical proportions. Why is it only the bad things that they think are of biblical proportions? I don't get that. I'm looking for the day when I turn on the TV and here's the weatherman standing next to the green screen and he's saying, as you can see, we've got a high pressure system moving in from the Dakotas, which means that the next week is gonna be about 72 degrees, bright sunshine and very little wind. It's gonna be a week of biblical proportions. I'm waiting for that, aren't you? But you know, in the, in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul, he, he said way back then that the world looks at everything around us, all of creation, all the beauty, all the warm days, all the rain, all the food, all the water, all the things that God gives us, the world looks at those things and refuses to accept God as creator. That's what Paul said way back then. And he said, and they refuse to give God thanks. We're not going to be those people, are we? We're not going to be those people. Praise God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, you are creator. Amen? You are creator. And I am your creation. Jesus, you are savior. And I am one that you have saved. Holy Spirit, you are leader. And I am one this morning that desires to be led. Move, oh God, I pray. I need you. Bless, I pray, this time together as we release your word into this sanctuary and we wait upon you to do fantastic things. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, I noticed that Tuesday is Valentine's Day. I'm not sure if any of you other guys noticed that, but I noticed Tuesday is Valentine's Day. And uh, so, what shall we talk about? <laughs> you know, I, Pastor Andrew and I have, have talked about this, but, and I think we're in agreement over this, but I have never felt like a slave to the secular calendar when it comes to deciding what I'm gonna preach about on Sunday morning. I don't feel like I have to preach about whatever is showing up on the secular calendar. I don't, of course, when it says Christmas, you know I'm gonna talk about the birth of the Savior. And yes, when it says Easter, you know I'm gonna talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. That's for sure. But these other secular holidays, I don't feel like I have to address everyone on Sunday morning. What am I supposed to do with National Hot Dog Day? <clears throat> hot dogs, hot dogs, hot dogs, hot dogs. Hot... What am I gonna do with National Sheet Metal Screw Day? <laughs> you know, what, what am I gonna do? But that's not to say that there aren't some holidays that work really well. And I think Valentine's Day is one of them. So yeah, today I'm gonna talk about love. But I want to talk about a form of love that I think we have for a long time misunderstood. And to do that, I need us all to go back to our high school days. I, I know. <laughs> so, somebody over in this area over here is saying to themselves, please don't make us go back there. My, my therapist says I'm doing so well. Isn't it amazing we survived high school? Woo-wee. But no, go with me back to high school for just a few minutes, especially you guys. Guys, go with me, and I want you to picture yourself standing next to the locker of the most beautiful girl in school. I mean, she is a vision of beauty. And I want, and you're standing there, and you're kind of having a little daydream. And in your daydream, you're picturing you and this girl, arm in arm, walking to your next class. 
You can picture you and this girl. She snuggled up next to you. And as you're going down Main Street, you got your arm out the window and the radio's on. She snuggled up next to you. <laughs> oh, of course, that was before seatbelt laws. <clears throat> But she's, you can picture her snuggled up next to you and, and you're driving down Main Street in your 1966 Ford Mustang, candy apple red, white vinyl top, E60s on the back, baby moons and chrome reverse all the way around. Sorry, I drifted off into one of my actual memories. <laughs> 1966 Mustang, cost me 700 bucks. In your mind, you see her writing her name and your name on the inside cover of her history book and then putting a big heart around it. And then all of a sudden you're shaken from your daydream as you realize she's actually standing right there in front of you in all her glory. And somehow you muster up enough courage to open up your mouth and out come these words. <clears throat> Zelda, <laughs> would you go steady with me? And with a look of total horror on her face, <laughs> Zelda says, Oh, Henry, Henry, I think we should just be friends. <laughs> <laughs> Crash and burn, right? <laughs> but friends, I think it is events like that that have given us a picture of a friend or a friendship that is actually much different than the picture we get in the Word of God. You see, here's the, here's the big idea today. Here's the, the crux of my whole message this morning. I don't think God ever uses the words, just friends. Mm -mm. No. As if there are some people that are very special to God and everybody else, well, we're just friends. No. I believe that the Word of God presents for us a picture of a friend or friendship that is very, very special. So, what does a friend or what does friendship mean to God? Well, when we think of a friend, I think we tend to put that friend or that relationship kind of right in the middle of what we might call the love scale. You know, down here is somebody we just met. We hardly know them. They're down at the bottom of the love scale. Way up at the top is mom and dad, brother and sister, husband, wife, your children, certain smoked meats. <laughs> you know, the things that we love... And then, but a friend we kind of put right there in the middle of the love scale. Hey, Cindy, saw you out with Bobby last night. Things are getting pretty serious, huh? No, we're just friends, right? Isn't that what we say? No, we're, we're just friends. We put a friend in the middle of the love scale. But you know, if you know your Bible, you know that there's a guy named Abraham and there's a guy named Moses. Did you know that those two men were referred to in the Bible as the friend of God? Yeah, think about Abraham. He was, he's known as the father of faith, the father of promise. And in Isaiah 41.8, it says that God, not men, but God referred to Abraham as Abraham, my friend. Isn't that amazing? I love that. Abraham, my friend. So how did Abraham become a friend of God? Well, we don't have to wonder because James in the New Testament, in that little letter that he wrote, he's going to tell us. James 2.23 says, And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited or reckoned to him as righteousness, there's that part where, did you know that in Galatians, Paul says that Abraham got the gospel in advance. Isn't that kind of cool? 
Way back in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, God said, or, or Paul says that Abraham got the gospel in advance. The gospel is salvation by God's grace through faith. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. He got the gospel in advance. I love that. But it went on and it said he was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. Any man, woman, boy or girl who will take their whole life and lay it before the Lord and say, I'm yours, Lord. Everything. Everything is yours. I take everything that I once considered mine. I take every possession. I take every right, every privilege, every dream I've ever had, every desire I've ever had, all my money, all my time, everything, Lord, that I have and that I am, I lay it before you. And Lord Jesus, I am trusting in you and you alone for the salvation of my soul. When a person does that, the Bible says that just like Abraham, that person is now credited with the righteousness, the perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that amazing or what? We receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ and we become God's friend. If you're a born again man or woman, boy or girl today, you are a friend of God. In the New Testament, Jesus called his disciples his friends. Huh. You know, he called some other people friends too. Do you remember a guy named Lazarus? Lazarus, Jesus and his disciples were out ministering and Lazarus' two sisters, Mary and Martha, sent word to Jesus saying, you gotta come back here. You gotta come back because Lazarus has gotten very sick. I mean, like, almost dead kind of sick. And in the Bible, it says that Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said, Lazarus, our friend. Lazarus, our friend, is sleeping, but I will go wake him. They went back, and when they got back, they walked into this scene, and Jesus walks up, and here's Mary and Martha, and they're crying, they're weeping and wailing, they're looking over here, and a bunch of people from town has showed up, and they're all crying. Why? Because Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. Jesus came too late. They're all crying, and the Bible tells us that when Jesus saw Mary and Martha, and they're crying, and he looked at all the townspeople, and they were crying, John, John, who was recording it, said, there was a tear running down the cheek of Jesus. Friends, if your picture of Jesus does not include a picture of a tear running down his face, you've got an incomplete picture of the Lord. If you don't see that kind of tenderness in your Savior, you've got an incomplete picture, a distorted picture. It says that Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. And it says that when the people saw Jesus crying over his friend Lazarus, the people said, see how he loved him. Now to Jesus, he never uses the words, just friends. Not Jesus. No way. Before Jesus went to the cross, he looked into the faces of his disciples and he said, greater love, greater is a measurement of quantity. Greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his, you tell me, friends. That he laid down his life for his friends. Right now, I want you to use that computer in your brain and I want you to pull up a sheet that lists all your friends, everyone that you consider a friend, and I want you to look down that List, how many are you ready to die for? Jesus said, greater love is, has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus considered a friend someone worth dying for. To Jesus, a friend is not in the middle of the love scale. He is way up here at the top of the love scale. I want you to see this this morning. Would you turn with me to the Gospel of John, 
John chapter 15 is where we're going to be. This is one of those times when I hope you'll really pull out your Bible and follow along. If it's on your phone, that's fine too, but if you've got a paper copy, maybe there's one in the pew next to you somewhere, follow along. There's some things I really want you to see. John chapter 15, and we're going to pick it up in verse 15. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. John 15 and then verse 15, Jesus says this. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Again, if you have been born again, you have surrendered your whole life to Jesus, then Jesus wants to share with you everything that the Father in heaven has for you, both in this life, but more importantly, in the life that stretches on for eternity. That's what Jesus wants for you when you become a friend of God. But friends, we know the story, don't we? Because shortly after Jesus called his disciples his friends, one of those friends actually betrayed him into the hands of the people that wanted Jesus dead. And then it wasn't long after that that Jesus' friends, his disciples, scattered. They ran away. Even Peter, the one who really, in kind of a boastful way, when, when Jesus was letting on that things are getting going to get really dark here, guys, to get real dark, I'm going to be taken away, and the sheep are going to be scattered. They're going to strike the sheep, and the sheep are going to be scattered. When he began to warn his disciples, wasn't it Peter who stood up and kind of boastfully said, No way! No way! Uh-uh! Well, maybe these guys will run away. Isn't that what he said? Even if these guys desert you, I won't. Lord Jesus, I will go to prison with you. I will die with you, Jesus. Even Peter denied the Lord three times. Sitting around that little campfire in the courtyard of the, of the high priest, Peter had three opportunities to stand up for Jesus, to go to prison with Jesus, to die with Jesus. And three times he failed just before the rooster crowed. And his Bible says that Peter ran off into the darkness weeping. Jesus' friends deserted him, even Peter. Have you ever been disappointed by a friend? Silly question. Have you ever been the friend that disappointed somebody else? Again, silly question. We're human. We're human. We, we blow it. We make mistakes. We disappoint people. But I'm here today to tell you that Jesus is the friend who never, ever disappoints. But that's not to say that he will never call you to something that you don't like. He will at times call you to things that don't seem to line up with what you thought you were going to be doing or where you were going to be going or how rich you're going to be. There are times when he might call you to something that at least at the beginning you don't think is so great. But let me tell you, if you will be obedient, you will find out that just out of your view, Jesus had something that is a hundred times better than what you thought was going to be good. He is the friend that never disappoints. But his friends walked out on him. His friends scattered. And so Jesus had to pick up that cross and walk toward Mount Calvary alone without his friends. And when he got to the top of that hill, Jesus suffered and suffered and suffered and died under the burden of every dirty, rotten, stinking thing that Gary Shaw has ever said, thought, or done. He suffered under the burden of my stinking sin. 
and he suffered under the burden of every dirty, rotten thing that you have ever said, thought, or done. Not for anything he did, but for what all of us collectively have done. He died there. His body was laid into a tomb waiting for Sunday morning. And Sunday morning early, those women came rushing to the tomb to finish what they weren't able to do on that Friday afternoon. And there they were met by an angel with a message for him. The angel said this, go quickly to the Lord's disciples, his friends. And one of the gospels actually adds this, especially Peter. Go to the Lord's disciples, especially Peter, and tell them Jesus wants to meet them in Galilee. Now, if you're a Bible reader, you've probably picked up on this. You probably already know that Jesus actually met with his disciples that very day, where they were hiding. They were hiding somewhere, and Jesus appeared to them that very day. So what's this meet Jesus in Galilee thing? Well, I believe that angel was saying something very unique is going to happen on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and especially going to happen to Peter. I think that's what was going on there. So I want us to look at that meeting today. So if you're still in John, go to the very last chapter of John's Gospel, chapter 21. We're going to see this meeting in Galilee that the angel was speaking about. Now, in, in chapter 21, the disciples have made their way back to Galilee, and they're doing what kind of came natural to them. Now, this isn't all the disciples. This, uh, from what I can gather, it's like seven of them. But what are they doing? They went fishing. A lot of these guys had fishing as their background. It was how they made money. I think it was how they relaxed. I think it was what they knew. They felt comfortable doing it. And so they went out and they spent the night fishing. They could, make, they could catch fish. They could sell fish. It was a way to make a few dollars. So they were doing this. They fished all night and they didn't catch anything. In the morning, the Bible says they looked up and they saw somebody standing on the shore, but they didn't recognize who it was. Until that person cried out and said, do you have any fish? And they answered back, no. Now, I don't know why this didn't ring a bell to these guys. Because <laughs> this isn't the first time. But Jesus answers back and says, throw your net on the other side of the boat and you'll catch a bunch of fish. Something should have gone off in their brains. <laughs> anyway, they throw the net on the other side of the boat and up comes this huge catch of fish, you know, practically breaking the nets, filling their boats. And then there was John, the gospel writer here, who yells out, It's the Lord! You know, ding, 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 ding. It's the Lord! And then something very funny happens, I think. If I'm in a boat with a bunch of people fishing, and I'm nice and dry, and I'm going to jump into the water, you know what I do? I take off a few things. I take off a few things that I don't want to get wet. But it says that Peter jumped into the water, but before he did, he put his stuff on. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if he thought he was just going to get out of the boat and maybe do that walking on the water again thing to, to, to Jesus. I don't know. But he stepped out of the boat and went kapoosh. And so here's this picture of Peter now. He's dog paddling towards the shore. And the rest of the guys, they got a whole huge boat full of fish. 153. Did you notice that it gives the number? 153 fish they caught. And they're hauling it back. They all get there, and there's this beautiful scene that they step into. This beautiful scene that they walk upon. And what they find is that Jesus has made breakfast. Tommy here today? Okay. Uh, yeah, food. Isn't it, isn't it food an amazing way to minister to people? Isn't this a wonderful picture of Jesus? They show up and Jesus has breakfast for them. Fresh bread and fish on the fire waiting for him. That is so cool. And here they are enjoying this fresh bread and this fish around the campfire. Amidst the laughter and the, the hugs and the slaps on the back, John records that suddenly the, the, the mood begins to change. 
Something is changing, and I, I kind of see Jesus has now begun to kind of kind of focus in and stare at Peter. Years later, years after this happened, John would sit down to write his gospel. It's believed that John was probably the last gospel written. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote theirs earlier, and John wrote his after theirs. But John sat down to write his account of this, and so what John did was he took the Aramaic language that was probably being spoken by Jesus and the disciples, he took that Aramaic language and he translated it into the written language of the day, which was Greek. Our, by our New Testaments are, were written originally in Greek. So he translates, translates it from Aramaic into Greek. And now today, our Bible producers, their Bible scholars take that Greek and translate it into English or Spanish or German or whatever. So we have Aramaic into Greek and then Greek into our language. That's how it works. If you were here last time I spoke, I said that sometimes we can get a little better understanding of what we're reading in our English Bibles if we'll just lift up the covers a little bit and take a peek at that Greek word that's laying right underneath the surface. And that's what I want to do again today because there's something here that I think is going to help us understand again the meaning of a friend. So if you're still there in John chapter 21, go with me over to verse 15. John says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Let me just address the more than these part first. What was Jesus asking? Honestly, scholars have some differing views on this. I'll share two, two popular views. Jesus said, do you love me, Peter, more than these? It's possible Jesus was looking at this scene. You've got the beautiful Sea of Galilee. I got some friends who, who were just last week in Israel. They've been putting on Facebook all these wonderful pictures of the Sea of Galilee and all that. Beautiful. So anyway, is it possible that Jesus looked, here's the beautiful Sea of Galilee, Peter's boat, his nets, a huge catch of fish? Is it possible that Jesus was saying, Peter, do you love me more than all of these? That's possible. Here's another possibility. Is it possible that Jesus was saying, Peter, do you love me more than these other disciples? That's possible too. Because remember, it was Peter who said, Lord, even if these guys run away, I never will. I'll die, I'll go to prison, I'll die. He was kind of saying, I love you more than these guys. These guys are run away. I, he was kind of saying that, wasn't he? It's possible that Jesus could have been saying, really, Peter? Really? Do you love me more than these? That's possible, too. I'm not going to say which way it is, but each one's possible. Uh, anyway, if we, if we boil this down, what Jesus was really asking Peter was, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Now again, John is taking those Aramaic words and translating them into Greek. And when he does that, he uses the most common Greek word for love that we find in the New Testament, and that's the word agape. Most of us have heard that word. Uh, if you've been around church for very long, the Greek word agape means love. So Jesus was saying, Peter, do you agape me? Peter answers, and Peter, in our English Bibles, says, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But here's an interesting thing. When you lift up the covers and look underneath, you find out that when John was recording this, he chose a different Greek word for love than the word agape. Here's what John actually wrote. Peter, or Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I philo you. 
philo. Now that word means love, but it carries with it this, with it this idea of a very deep, deep friendship. Philo, that's the same, it's a, it's a form of the same word that Jesus used when he said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. So in a way, Peter was saying, yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, we are friends. Remember, Abraham, your friend. Moses, your friend. Peter, your friend. That's kind of what Peter was saying. I love you. We have this deep friendship. Jesus, he told Peter to feed his lambs. But then he asked Peter again. A second time, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me? And Peter answers again, yes, Lord. You know that I philo. I am your friend. Jesus says, take care of my sheep. Now, I have to believe that at this time, the, the mood around that campfire is very different. I picture the, the rest of the disciples, they're looking down. They're looking down. They got a stick. They're poking the embers. They don't want to look up because they know how embarrassing this is for Peter. But here's the thing. Jesus is not done. He's not done. Because he's going to ask a third time. Now, the Bible tells us that Peter was hurt by the third question. And we go, well, duh, of course, we get it. We see Peter in the courtyard of the high priest denying Jesus three times. And now, around a different campfire on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus is sitting right next to him, asking him, do you love me three times? And we go, yes, I get that. Whose feelings wouldn't be hurt? But friends, again, when I lift up the covers and I look at the Greek underneath, I find another reason why Peter would have been hurt specifically by the third question. This is what I wanted to share with you this morning. See, twice Jesus asked Peter, do you agape me? And twice Peter said, yes, Lord, philo, friends. But the third time, in the Greek translation, the third time, Jesus turns it around. The third time, Jesus does not ask Peter, do you agape me? Jesus asks Peter, Felice, are we friends? Oh. Oh. Now I think we can really understand why Peter would specifically be hurt by the third question. Friends, I, can, I think I can feel the emotion building up in Peter when Peter answers and he says, Lord, Lord, you know everything. You know. And he uses that word again, philo. You know that I'm your friend. Have you ever heard somebody say, are you saying or praying? Are you say what does that mean? It means, are you saying something is true or are you only hoping it's true? Are you saying something is true or are you just praying that it's true? I wonder if that might be happening here. I wonder if Peter is actually saying, Lord, you are God. And I have seen what you are able to do. 
I have seen that you have the ability to look into a man or a woman's heart and know exactly what's going on. Lord, I have seen you look into the heart of a rich young man who said he wanted to follow you, and when you looked into his heart, you saw that his riches had a death grip on his heart, and his riches were going to drag that young man all the way to hell. And so you told that young man, go now and sell everything everything that you have, give it to the poor and come and follow me. Jesus, I know what you can do. I know how you can look into somebody's heart. I just wonder if Peter wasn't saying, do it to me. Look inside me. Look inside this fisherman. Look inside this guy who talks too much. Look inside this guy who brags too much. Look inside this guy who never fulfills what he said he's going to do. And when you do, I hope and I pray that you find a man who truly loves you and who's truly your friend. I think he was praying it as much as he was saying it. I think Jesus did look into that man's heart. I think he looked into Jesus or into Peter's heart. And I think he found a true friend. Pastor Gary, why are you convinced of that? Because of the very strange thing Jesus, the next thing Jesus said is so strange. It doesn't belong in there. Get this, get this picture. Peter has just said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And what is Jesus' response? Peter, when you were young, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted to go. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands. Stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Can you imagine the look on Peter's face? What? What? Well, Lord, what, what, what was that now? Uh, I thought we were talking about love and, and friends. And, 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 and Is this a riddle? Is, it, is this a riddle? Is this another one of those riddles that I need to figure out? Oh, man. What is going on? I'll tell you something is going on. Something is going on. John, again, the writer of this gospel, he knows Peter doesn't really understand what's going on here. And he knows that the readers, you and I, we wouldn't understand it either. So John slips in this one line commentary. John says this. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Hmm. Church tradition tells us that eventually Peter would be martyred for his faith. He would be killed for his faith. Tradition tells us that he was eventually crucified and that at his own request, he would be crucified upside down because he didn't want anyone to mistake him for the savior of the world. So. That's why I'm convinced that Jesus looked into Peter's heart and saw a friend because it was Jesus who said, greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. He looked into the future and saw Peter would do that. He saw in Peter the heart of a friend who would make the ultimate expression of his love and his friendship. He laid down his life for his love and his faith and his trust in Jesus. But friends, G Peter did this only because he had already received the, the very best example in Jesus himself. Not because Jesus laid down his life just for Peter, no. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Peter got the example of Jesus laying down his life for everyone, anyone who would come, and like I said before, surrender. Surrender their life to Jesus. Anyone who comes to him and says, I'm a sinner. 
be merciful to me. I want to be clean. After telling Peter what lay before him, Jesus spoke two words. Follow me. Follow me. And friends, down through the centuries, Jesus has continued to ask, to ask that question and give that command. The question, do you love me? Are you my friend? The command, follow me. Friends, there's a church that meets here. There's a church here this morning, and I hope you know I'm not talking about carpeting and two-by-fours and things like that. There's a church that meets here because for, what is it, 60 years at least, 60 years, something like that? For about 60 years, men and women have been saying, I love you, Lord. For 60 years or so, men and women have come here saying, I love you, Lord. I am your friend. And there's a church here today because those same people said, yes, I will follow you wherever that journey takes me. I will do it. If it costs me everything, if it cost me the future I was dreaming about, I'll let it go. I'm yours. I'm dead to the world and alive to God. This church is here because over the years, people have said, I love Jesus and I'm following him. And you gather together because you're like-minded. And this church continues to grow. This church is continuing to grow because more and more people are saying, I love Jesus. Amen. And nobody's stopping me. I'm going to follow him wherever this takes me. Would you stand with me this morning? If you have made that decision to follow Jesus... If you have surrendered your life to him, this will be dangerous. Will you sing an old chorus with me? Yeah. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how many remember it. Sing this old chorus with me. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship. My soul rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord Jesus. And I'm not afraid for my friends to hear me say that. I'm not afraid, I'm not ashamed to call you my Savior and my King. Friends, if you're here today, I just, before we leave, I just want to give you an opportunity. Would you trust me when Pastor Gary says, I, in no way am I going to embarrass you. But this is so important. If you're here today and you've never made that clear decision, you've heard a lot, you've, you've been to church, you've heard the preaching, you've heard the singing, but today something's different. God has broken through in some way today. And you know that you need to make that clear declaration between you and God. I am choosing to surrender my life to you today, this, Lord Jesus, this day, Lord Jesus. 
come and save me. If, if that's you here today, with nobody looking around, would you just raise your hand and then put it right back down again? I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to pray right along with you. Anybody here today? Yep, I'm seeing hands there. Hands there. Thank you for your honesty. You're, what you're doing is just being honest before God. He's broken, before, broken through. Anybody else today? We've had a couple people saying, I want to know that our sins are forgiven and I'm on my way to heaven. Anybody else? We're going to pray. Those of you that raised your hands, it's not important what Pastor Gary says right now. It's really not. Because the same God who is able to penetrate our hearts has already looked into yours. And he knows. He knows whether it's, this is real, your heart is broken before him and you love him and you want to surrender to him, or if you're playing a silly game, he already knows. So just invite him. I'm going to pray a prayer, but you, you allow the Lord to scan your heart. And you can pray right along with me. In fact, would you all pray along with me this morning as we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you. Your Holy Spirit has broken through into my life and revealed Jesus as my only hope. I confess to you, I am a sinner. I have broken every law when I broke just one. I am guilty, and I am in need of a Savior. I am a great sinner, but Jesus, you are a greater Savior. I put my trust in you and you alone. I surrender my past, my present, my future. It is yours. I will walk with you. I will pray. I will read your word. I will gather with other believers until that day that you take me home. I love you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you prayed that prayer in sincerity and brokenness before the Lord, not Pastor Gary, but the Word of God says, your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. And you are on your way. You have just begun a journey, an adventure that you maybe have never dreamed. Get ready. You're going to need the people standing around you. You're going to need them. And we need you too. Amen? Amen? God bless you guys. Would you take some time and fellowship together this morning?